Well, there have not been criteria for response to hydroxyurea until recently. And again, a, um, a subset of uh, uh, European investigators um, came up with criteria for defining response. And they very clearly state in their position paper that the criteria have been selected to address the myeloproliferative nature of polycythemia vera. And so in their criteria, they do not list as a response criteria absence of thromboembolic events. After all, that's a time-dependent variable. It's affected by multiple other risk factors. Instead, they focused on control of the myeloproliferative neoplasm and the symptoms and signs related to that. And so response by the ELN definition has included a, um, a hematocrit less than 45% without phlebotomy, um, normal platelet count, normal white blood cell count, absence of symptomatic splenomegaly, absence of um, disease-related symptoms. It's important to recognize that in this um, position paper that the investigators state that those things need to be achieved after at least three months of therapy with hydroxyurea with at least two grams, if not more, of hydroxyurea a day. And so, of course, the ability to achieve those endpoints will depend on the amount of time on hydroxyurea and the dose that's used. Often, I see patients referred to me who are put on 500 milligrams of hydroxyurea once a day and then just continue phlebotomy. I think it's important that once this drug hydroxyurea is chosen, that it is pushed to its maximally tolerated dose to achieve those response criteria. Well, once you define what response is to hydroxyurea, um, or response in the disease in general, then it's possible to define uncontrolled. And uncontrolled polycythemia vera would be absence of those complete and partial remissions. Complete remission includes not only control of hematocrit, the white count, the platelet count, without phlebotomy, control of the spleen and symptoms, but also normalization of the bone marrow morphology. And a partial response does not require normalization of the bone marrow. In in patients who don't achieve a complete or partial remission, those would be patients um, that you might consider for alternative therapies. So intolerance to hydroxyurea is um, um, pretty uncommon, and it depends on what type of intolerance we're talking about. And I would divide it, as we divide many adverse events in clinical trials, between hematologic and non-hematologic toxicities. In terms of the hematologic toxicity, of the drug. This might be the most important one to consider in looking at the life expectancy of our patients. So hematologic toxicity would be defined as development of a neutrophil count under 1,000 or a thrombocytopenia um, at doses of hydroxyurea that are required to shrink the spleen so it's not symptomatic or maintain the hematocrit less than 45% without phlebotomy. What that really says to me is that the hematologic toxicity is in a spectrum of the disease related to a bone marrow failure syndrome. There's fewer, there's less bone marrow reserve to tolerate the toxic effects of hydroxyurea on normal hematopoiesis. The, the reason why that's important is that in a retrospective study by um, uh, Alvaraz Loran from Spain, um, with his colleagues where they looked at 250 patients with polycythemia vera. They found that out of 30 patients who they found to be um, resistant to hydroxyurea, most of them, 24 of the 30, were considered resistant because they could not tolerate a dose of hydroxyurea to maintain the hematocrit, shrink the spleen without causing cytopenias. What's important about that is that group of patients with resistance to hydroxyurea had a higher risk of death and transformation to AML, somewhere around six to seven times higher than patients who didn't develop um, resistance to hydroxyurea. But there's also non-hematologic toxicity, which I believe is less common, um, the most important of which to recognize um, are leg ulcerations, uh, typically occurring um, over the lateral malleolus, quite painful, very difficult to heal, in my experience, they typically only go away if you completely stop hydroxyurea. Um, often I've used hyperbaric oxygen to help uh, speed the healing process. Um, the other less common um, toxicities 
uh, would be uh, uh, GI toxicity. Um, and then finally, there are incredibly rare toxicities that I've seen. Um, I've only seen one case of each in my 25 years of practice. One is a um, patient who developed fever and alveolitis, a pulmonary toxicity that's been described with hydroxyurea, quite rare. And another patient that I had who developed um, acceleration of multiple cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas, so acceleration of cutaneous skin cancers, non-melanomatous, uh, with hydroxyurea. Those are some of the um, reasons for intolerance.